It's a wonder if many people understand some of the changes that has been made that have been made to the local government system and also what those changes mean to the current system. I know they've been a, a, an entire process of amending the local government system or elections regime since I think around 2000 or even preceding that. And last year, August, we saw the passage of four legislative uh, bills in the National Assembly dealing with the local government system and elections. Three of those bills, the president has assented to, one the president has not. The purpose of our speakers here this morning, and in particular, we'll hear from uh, Mr. Alexander, where he'll try to make sense of some of the, uh, the extricacies of the system and explain it, and hopefully explain it in layman's terms so that we can all understand what those changes means for us. We'll have also the Chief Elections Officer who, besides from now, this morning, I didn't know he was an excellent uh, architect and designer. I see he, he has designed the Pegasus uh, conference room very aesthetically with many designs on the walls, paintings, if you want to call them those. But Mr. Lowenfield will tell us about GCOM's uh, readiness in the event there is local government elections and also to tell us about the, the commission's role in the entire local government system and how they go about um, demarcating the various constituencies that will be contested in the event there is an election. Without uh, any further ado, I will invite our first speaker to the podium and I'll call the President of the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and Industry, uh, Mr. Lance Hines, to give a few remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Distinguished members of the head table, Mr. Alexander, Ms. Lowenfield, Vice President of the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce, Chairman and Commissioners of the Ghana Elections Commission, Chairman of the Private Sector Commission, fellow business support organizations, media ladies and gentlemen. Let me also, on behalf of the executive and councillors and members in the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and Industry, welcome all of you and thank you for taking the time this morning to participate with us in this very relevant, topical, critical discussion. Whenever I engage in discussions such as these, I'm reminded of a story I used to go to when I was in, when I was in University of the US. It was called Sims, and their catchy slogan was an educated consumer is the best customer. And what I like to equate that to is that a more educated voter is a more informed citizen, which leads to better governance and overall improvement in the administration of nation's affairs. In the coming years, we cannot afford to cast our vote based on simplistic and somewhat tribal sometimes decisions that are rooted in the past. We believe now more than ever there are more fundamental issues that need to be taken into consideration. Our voting therefore must conceptually de determine the direction that we wish to take as a nation, hopefully for the next 50 years. So part of this education process, it is our belief that the Chamber Need, and belief of the chamber that most of us needs to have a, a better working knowledge of how electoral systems work, how allocation of seats work, for example. How does a party win the presidency, the majority in parliament, and what does that mean? What are regional seats, what are top seats? How many people know that they represent representation requirements such as gender? The local government process is critical from the standpoint that we as citizens have the most direct opportunity to engage and participate in what could be called the entry level stage of the governance process. It also gives us the first opportunity as citizens, if we choose to, to serve. It is critical, therefore, since the possibility of local elections are now being floated, to understand what we are voting, what it is we are voting for, and more importantly, what we want to vote for. This is to some extent will form the basis of the decisions that we make going forward. This, therefore, is the genesis of the, for of the forum we are hosting today. The Chamber of Commerce has recognized that it is critical that public education events such as these are held as part of providing an overall awareness 
of the issues pertaining to this church or the nation's affairs. So ladies and gentlemen, like you, I look forward to a most productive presentation and discussion this morning and hope that it goes a long way to providing the clarity we need in the pursuit of being an informed citizenry and ultimately a voter fully equipped to determine their nation's destiny. Thank you very much. I'm happy with the turnout. I hope more people uh, show up as the morning goes along. Uh, it's just indicative that persons are very interested in what happens in their um, national and civic life in Guyana. And I think you should give yourselves a round of applause for being here this morning just to hear about the local government system. We'll just move the program right along. Uh, this morning's session is an informative one. It's not a persuasive one. It, it does not intend to uh, convince anybody of any position, but just to outline what the facts are. So with that being said, I'll invite uh, our first uh, speaker, guest speaker, Mr. Vincent Alexander. In so doing, we may refer to Article 71, one in the first instance of the Constitution, which states, local government is a vital aspect of democracy and shall be organized so as to involve as many people as possible in the task of managing and developing the communities in which they live, end of quote. It therefore means that local government should not exist at the discretion or the behest of the government, and that it is not merely administrative. It is integral to the development process at the local level in the sphere of decision making and implementation. And I emphasize that it is not administrative because local government systems can be administrative only. But when one looks at our constitution, one gets a clear understanding that the system is intended to go beyond being merely administrative and to be a part of the political architecture. The question which therefore arises is how does the local government system structurally, functionally, and procedurally reflect that developmental role. This presentation is restricted to the electoral system. So in a sense, it's restricted to the procedural aspect of local government. And we therefore focus on the way in which that system facilitates the people's involvement in the development process or contributes to their personal development. And here I'd like to underline the fact that the electoral process not only allows for the people's involvement in the development process, but it in itself may contribute to their development. And I say that because I come from the school of development which is embraced by Tadaro, and he underlines three objectives of development. The first one refers to raising the living level of people through the relevant growth processes. And here largely we're talking about economic growth and the availability of income, and goods, and services. What he goes on to say is also about creating conditions conducive to growth of people's self-esteem through the establishment of a system which promote dignity and self-respect. So we're going beyond economic growth when we talk about development here, and we're talking about human development and the aspect of the human self-esteem and human dignity. And I would wish to associate that aspect with a local government system which allows people 
to elect their representatives. And in that regard, once that system is in place and it works, then it in itself contributes to human development. The third leg which he refers to is increasing people's freedom through increased choices. So the context I'm trying to create is one where the elections are not just about putting a government in place, but is in itself a contributor to human growth and human development, given the psychological aspect and the spiritual aspect of human existence. Article 71.2 underlines the point that I've made. And it says, Parliament shall provide for the institution of a countrywide system of local government. Countrywide system. Through the establishment of organs of local democracy, as an integral part of the political organization of the state, end of quote. So we see local government is not merely administrative. It is intended to be and spelled out to be a part of the political organization of the state. This article reiterates the intended nature of local government in Guyana and specifies that it shall be established. It's not a matter of discretion. No government in Guyana shall be established. The Constitution also essays the local government bodies that shall be established or maintained. Those are municipalities, neighborhood democratic councils, and such other subdivisions, including village and community councils. In the case of village and community councils, the Constitution specifies that the Parliament should provide the framework for the establishment of those councils, which may be established at the behest of the citizens. And I think we need to underline that as well. That's an aspect that little or no attention has been paid to. But our constitution does provide for the re-establishment of village councils we've really started. But it is not mandatory. It, they, they will only be established if the citizens themselves call for the establishment. But what the parliament is obligated to do is to put in place a mechanism for them to call and for those councils to be established. And for the time being, this is being observed in the breach. That these bodies should be elected is also provided for in the Constitution in Article 78b, where it states, and I quote, the electoral system in respect of local democratic organs below the regional democratic councils shall provide for the involvement and the representation of individuals and voluntary groups in addition to political parties and accountability to the electors. What I want to underline here is that we have now put in place a system allows for political parties to participate in local government elections, and that was the case before, for voluntary groups, community groups to participate, and that also was the case up to 1994. But it has added the involvement of individuals, officially unrelated, unconnected to any group or any political party. There are two key terms in that article, representation and accountability. That suggests 
that the framework of local government in Guyana is representative of democracy. And that those representatives should be held responsible by the electorate for the conduct of the affairs of the communities. So the, the Constitution seeks to make it very clear the manner in which the affairs of councils should be conducted. They are not councils unto themselves, they are representative bodies, and they should be accountable to the people who they represent. It is that postulation that has resulted in a local government electoral system as articulated thus. One, an election of a council or local authority in each of the six municipalities and 65 neighborhood democratic council areas. Area. So it's clear that for the time being, we should have elections in six municipalities and 65 neighborhood democratic councils. I say for the time being, because in geographic terms, Guyana has already been divided into a larger number of neighborhood democratic areas. But we have concentrated on the coast in terms of our local authority areas, only venturing in Region 9 and Region 1 to have an overall of three neighborhood democratic councils in those areas. So there's much scope for more neighborhood democratic councils. And I suppose the question of population may eventually influence the establishment of those councils. Two, the division of each area into a number of constituencies, equivalent to half of the number of councillors who shall comprise the council. Now, this is one of the new elements where rather than the election being held at the level of the local area being seen as one constituency, and that alone for elections, each local area will now be divided into a number of constituencies equivalent to half of the number of seats which will comprise uh, the council. Three, the election of 50% of the councillors through proportional representation in which the entire area is treated as one and political parties or groups compete for those seats by the nomination of lists of candidates. So 50% of the seats will in fact be elected through the old proportional representation system. Will not facilitate the involvement of individuals. Will only see the involvement of political parties and groups. And the seats for that 50% of the council will be distributed on a proportional representation basis reflecting the proportion of votes each party or group may have attained at the elections. The remaining 50% are elected one for each constituency based on political parties and groups nominating one candidate each for a constituency and individuals also contesting in those constituencies. So where we have the constituencies, where there are the constituencies, parties may also put up an individual candidate for each constituency. Groups may put up an individual candidate for each constituency, but individuals unrelated to those parties, unrelated to those groups, may themselves come forward to run in a constituency. By way of example, Georgetown has 30 councillors. Georgetown has been divided into 15 constituencies. So there will be the opportunity for political parties, community groups, and individuals within those 15 constituencies 
contest for a seat, which represents a constituency seat. Thus, a voter will be required to vote where registered and resident. First, for a list to elect the 50% who will represent the entire area and will be elected based on the PR system. And second, for an individual who will represent the constituency. After the group or political party would have been allocated their proportion or number of seats based on the proportion of votes gained from the votes for the area councillors, the group or party will identify their candidates who will be councillors. So we're talking about the list system, the parties will still have, the groups will still have, they will have a list of a number of persons exceeding the number of seats available. And based on the number of seats allocated to them, they will then draw from the list the persons whom they wish to be their councillors. So that the electors will know in advance of the list, but they will not know in advance of who will be drawn from the list. That prerogative still remains with the parties for the 50% seats that will be contested for the entire area. On the other hand, each winner in a, in a, in a constituency will be awarded a seat. So one will be able to know in advance who are the individuals contesting for constituency seats. And one will be able to vote for an, an individual and to determine the person who will represent the constituency. That's a fundamental change in the system. It is this collective that will then comprise the council from which they shall elect the mayor and deputy or the chairman and vice chairman each year for the three years life of the council. These councils are really supposed to have a life of three years. But the mayor, deputy mayor, chairperson, vice chairperson would be elected annually. They're not intended to be in situ for the entire three years. So we can rotate those persons, as the system presently provides for, but not being uh, actualized, though there is a uh, provision for the actualization. There was a period between, between 1997 and I think 2008, when the amendment to the local government elections act did not provide for the annual election. When the system of electing was put in abeyance to facilitate the reform, and the parliament at that time also placed in abeyance the election of the mayor and vice and deputy, chairman and vice during uh, that period. All of those councillors will be representatives. However, the individual constituency member will be more identified with the voters and will be expected to relate to them during their term of office. Obviously, if you have a constituency and you have an identifiable person being elected, then there is a basis for a relationship, direct, a direct relationship between that person and the electorate. The others shall be general and shall relate more from a party or group perspective. The other councillors, general councillors, will still be largely identified with the party and may well be 
looking back to their party rather than forward <laughs> to the electorate uh, in the process. That the electoral system is mixed is intended to allow for representation, proportionate to the number of votes gained. This approach, however, does not facilitate the desired intimacy or connectivity between the unidentifiable elected official and the electors. It is the constituency councillors who provide that opportunity. Hence, the system is balanced between proportional representation and accountability to the constituents. This was clearly the intent of the reform process, the intent of the Constitution, and the intent of the Parliament. The Constitution and the electoral system reflects that intent, but more explicitly